Okay, here we go. So hello and welcome to another Foreman community demo. Please note that this demo is being recorded. So if you've problems with the live stream, you can watch back at a later stage. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us on Freenode.irc or on the YouTube live chat, as both are being monitored. And before we begin, we just have one release announcement. So Foreman 3. Uh, sorry, 2.3.2 has been released. And it, er, this was earlier this week, and included in this release is 16 bug fixes. And also, this release adds missing pull core Debian options for Foreman 2.3 with Catello 3.8. And for more information, check out the release announcements and the Foreman community discourse. Um, in the next few weeks, Foreman 2.4, the first release candidate, should be released. And the announcement for that will be available. Um, will be available on the Foreman community discourse when it comes out. And I think that's, that is everything from me for now. Um, I'm just looking at the stream. It is It might be a little bit slow today, or for the beginning at least. So if there are any questions, if there's a bit of a lag, just ask questions as they come up. And um, I'll make sure that they are answered. Um, and our first demo of the day is going to be Andre with Ansible Galaxy Roll install location. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I just have a quick update about Galaxy Roll uh, Rolls installation uh, that we are having for quite some time now. But there was a slight improvement. Uh, so that's uh, Ansible. Ansible Galaxy, um, that I'm not seeing right now. Okay, yeah. Ansible Galaxy install from Galaxy that allows you to install the uh, roles from Galaxy. Usually, you want to do that uh, on the smart proxy. And uh, Ansible itself uh, changed the default location uh, so that. Uh, this field became uh, quite important because we are looking for the roles by default in ETC Ansible roles. And the default is uh, in the user user space. So uh, you probably want to use the location. And it was not possible because it was not working. But uh, we fixed it. So. Right now, if you don't uh, use the location, it will use uh, the ETC uh, Ansible roles. We changed the default back to what Ansible had, because that's where we are looking for the roles right now. And if you want to change that, you just type in your location. Um, And hit submit. And this should install the roles where you want to have them, where you set the smart proxy to look for them. We go to the right. Take some time. Yeah. Mm hmm. And here we see that it's actually got installed in the location I've I've edited. So that that was it. Just a simple fix. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Um, so far, I don't see any questions. But if you do have a comment or a question for Andre, you can do you can ask at any point. And I think you're yeah. You're just finished presenting live now, so there's a small there's a small bit of a delay. Um, so up next is uh, let me see is Dominic um, talking about a bug fix about remote execution, I believe. Yes, that's right. Uh, hello, everyone. 
uh, I made a little bug fix in remote execution plugin that is used for running some job invocations and so on on our hosts and uh, probably you will see my screen and the bug fix is happen in this uh, row uh, oh, simple uh, where uh, we can see that my last execution for this for this uh, hosts failed but we don't know uh, what kind of execution it was uh, so now it is possible to use the link that is on this text to navigate to the execution that happens that happens uh, what failed so that's all from me thank you dominic and let me just check for questions nothing so far let me see now. No, so, so our next demo, which is going to run, and I will hold him to it eight, for eight minutes and 42 seconds, is uh, Bernard Suttner with uh, Foreman and application centric uh, deployment. So, when you're ready, Bernard. So, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm pretty sure that I will not require. Um, eight minutes and 42 seconds i have started my time watch just so you know <laughs> yeah. so i think you should see my screen now so what i will tell you now is um just a, a short part of a presentation which will be at config management camp slash fostem on february the 6th it's about application centric deployment um, with a new plugin uh, which we have created at Attics. So the plugin is about deploying um, whole applications. So modern applications are normally using not only one server or only don't need only one host. So they need a lot of different hosts, a lot of different applications need to interact somehow so that, for example, a web application can be used um, using a proxy. The proxy forwards requests to Apache servers, and the Apache servers are using Tomcat servers. Um, and of course, all the Tomcat servers want to use a Postgres database. And to uh, deploy these hosts all together, and to configure all these hosts all together using, for example, like an Enso playbook, we have created a new um, plugin. So that plugin, um, you can find it here. I think you should see my browser now. So that plugin um, will add a new menu item here called applications. And it, um, is using three different parts. Um, Ansible playbooks to manage your Ansible playbooks, so to let the new plugin know which Ansible playbooks exists. Then you have some application definitions, which are somehow templates of an application. And um, in the end, an application instance, which is uh, using an application definition and then can be rolled out. Um, so it will, in the end, um, deploy hosts and configure these hosts using the Ansel playbook. Um, so what we have created is not using form and Ansible. Um, and we are using a smart proxy um, and we're using a new provider to configure the applications later on. Um, so that smart proxy um, is providing a new remote execution provider called ACD, so application centric deployment. So before, uh, what you need to do is to create an Ansible playbook. I already have created one, for example, the web app. You need to specify the path, the play file, and then you 
just simply press submit. So that pass is the location of your Ansel playbook on your foreman. Then you have an application definition. So also I've already created one, um, for example, um, LAMP server, which requires two different um, services. So if you want to deploy that application, you need to have web servers and database services. And as you see, we're using React. So we have we use um, Foreman models, for example. Um, and now I'm able to change Ansible variables. So for example, the dummy var, um, I can lock these um, parameters that in the end application instance is not able to change the parameters again. And these parameters in that application definitions are read from your Ansible playbook um, group variables. Um, you can also override um, parameters from your host group. So for example, um, you can define which compute profile you want, or you can also, for example, um, set the lifecycle environment. So I want to have a new lifecycle environment, library, lifecycle environment. It's fine. And save it. So these are the application definition. That's something like a, a template. And that template will then be used by the application instance to actually deploy that application or run the playbook. Or if you want, you can also customize the playbook run first. So in an application instance, you can, as I said, you need to select the application definition, so the template, and then you will, you will use or you will add hosts. So in this case, we have a host called W1 and a host called um, D1, and it's using the service web and DB from the application template, uh, what we have uh, seen before. And you also can, again, override the parameters. Um, in this case, the parameter is locked, so that I'm not able to override this one, um, but I can override the dummy bar change the parameters, five. But as you see, I cannot add new parameters. In the application instance, it's not possible to, to add parameters, it's just possible to change parameters if they are not locked. So submit. And now if I would press deploy, which would take a long time, it would um, create in, in our case, two different hosts. Um, the idea is that after the host is deployed, it will automatically run the answer playbook. This is something which we um, still need to do. But what you can do is to run the playbook. If I now press the run playbook button, it will connect to the smart proxy and it will run that playbook. And we want that it's easy to be used. So um, we download the playbook from Foreman bef um, before it will be executed. So if you have, for example, three different smart proxies, you need to deploy the Ansel playbook on your Foreman. And if you then run the playbook on the smart proxy, um, the first action will be um, on the smart proxy to get the playbook from Foreman, download it, um, write the inventory file, and then, um, well, run the playbook. So for that, we have a, our a new, as I said, a new um, job provider, and we also have um, a new um, job template created. Oh, sorry. Don't need to cancel the job. Um, so, of course, we have... a. Uh, um, open sourced all that stuff. So you can find it uh, in our 
GitHub um, project space form and uh, in this in the location form an ACD. And the smart proxy is also available, smart proxy ACD, and you can find it here. Um, what do we want to do in the future? Um, so we still need to do and to add a lot of tests. Um, we need to fix a lot of bugs, pretty sure. Um, we will get a lot of feedback, hopefully, so that we will need to uh, um, have a look at that feedback and maybe fix bugs or add some small um, features. We want to make sure that after an application instance is deployed, that it also is um, configured. Um, well, it would be interesting if we can have these application templates um, somewhere, maybe on GitHub, um, and that application um, template would um, look um, would have an application definition and its playbook. So, for example, you have a Kubernetes application template, and if you download it to your uh, foreman, it will um, be able to deploy and configure a Kubernetes um, cluster completely. Uh, that is the idea of the project. Uh, and we are, well, working hard to get all that stuff done. And now it's time if you have questions or, as I said, um, have a look at uh, the FOSTEM or Config Management Camp talk. Or if you have, uh, if you are familiar with German, um, I will have similar talk on next uh, Tuesday at our Linux Stammtisch. Uh, so visit our website, Artixd, you will find more stuff about that. So thank you very much. Thanks, Bernard. Um, so far, I don't see any questions. I was just wondering if anyone on the, if anyone here on the Hangout wants to say anything or ask Bernard anything about this? Mm. I would have one. Why have you decided not to go with the Ansible implementation we have? Just for the playbook download or were there other reasons? Well, the, the form and Ansible um, is something like host centric. So it can be used to uh, um, configure one host. But what we need is to uh, um, or what we want to have is one playbook which is able to deploy a whole application. So, and um, then we need to deploy different hosts. And after these hosts are deployed, we want to run for one time, one Ansible playbook. And I, I, I think that is not possible with Form Ansible right now. Yeah, I think you are right. Thank you, Bernard. Anyone else? Uh, okay. I would say that, um, Bernard, there will probably be some questions as people watch this back in time. Um, sure. but in, so yeah, but thank you very much um, for coming today. And in uh, so, but yeah. And next up is um, we're going to start our Catello demos. So next up is Jonathan with a demo of Red Hat subscriptions consumed in report template macro. <laughs> that is a mouthful. That is a yeah. definitely what I'm what I'm presenting. So <laughs> I was All looking I was looking for the preposition in that sentence and hoping I was mm. picking picking the right one. But anyways, please you can you can more eloquently introduce that than I, I I was struggling to come up with the title. So um I think it's better to be shown. In any case, um yes, what I am showing today is a is an RFE we got, so I thought it would be really good to share since uh, folks are obviously interested in it. And it's a, a new macro for our host reporting templates. Um, which will show you the number of Red Hat subscriptions being consumed by your hosts. So um, what I've done here previously is I've cloned my last check-in 
host template. And um, I've created a new one here called the last check-in with a Red Hat subscription count. And um, before I generate that, let me just show you um, how I modify the template, what the name of the macro is, and uh, what my host looks like. All right. Um, down in this report, I simply added a new header called Red Hat Subscriptions Consumed. And I added the same here. And you can see I'm calling the macro host Red Hat Subscriptions Consumed. Of course, you could call the, um, the title of the, uh, the header, whatever you like. But uh, the macro name has to match there. And you can see um, under the Help tab, if you don't know already, I'm sorry, um, where am I looking here? Yes, under the help tab, you can look under uh, the global methods here and uh, Red Hat subscriptions consumed is right there. So you don't need to remember this. But in any case, um, that is how I modified my template. So let me go and generate this now. And uh, that will take a minute to generate. So while I'm doing that, I'll show you what the subscription state of my host is. Apologies, my VM is a little slow this morning. All right, pressing generate. I'm going to select HTML in this case. Oh, interesting. Well, we'll try that again in a second, but let me show you my subscriptions um, quickly here. So on my content host um, here, I've got a total of three subscriptions attached. One is a custom product and one is a Red Hat subscription. Um, that I've imported from my manifest. And you see, I've got two line items here. So in my um, report template, I would expect to see two here um, reported for each Red Hat subscription. Now, if I had a, another subscription, say with quantity five, um, then I would see seven here. Let me try generating that again. I generated it right before this meeting, so or this demo, so that error was a bit surprising. Hmm. Okay. Well, um, it appears I'm having a bit bad luck generating this uh, template. However, um, you can call the host Red Hat Subscriptions Consumed Macro, and you can see how many Red Hat subscriptions you have consumed in uh, across your infrastructure. And that is all that I had. Thank you. Sometimes the demo gods are are not with us, Jonathan. Um, I know. It's it's all in the game. Um, so up. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, let me check. And we don't have any questions so far, Jonathan. So we can move on to Chris with his demo of updating bulk system purpose UI. Okay. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right. Um, so are you able to see it okay? Looks good, Chris. Thank you. Okay. So I wanted to show um, the old way, the old form. Um, so let me just go ahead and show that. So this is the bulk system purpose. Um, so just to give a, a quick refresh of the feature, um, we can we allow uh, don't let this guy do it. You can go in and um, on an individual host set the different service levels. Um, but if you had multiple hosts, you know, that's going to get time consuming pretty quickly. Um, so what we did is we added the, the ability to set that on multiple hosts. Let me go ahead and show this guy. This is what the old form looked like. Um, I demoed this in the past. Uh, so what I want to do is show you what the new form looks like. You get a sign, it would tell you how many hosts you were doing it on. Um, so the new guy, and I'll actually run it on this guy looks like this. We got some feedback from our um, our UI team. Um, and it looks a lot better. It matches quite a bit of the other mobiles within um, the following format. 
Um, so we've got, we moved the, how many hosts are doing up at the top here. Um, this is all in bold font, um, so forth. And uh, we moved the assigned one down here. Uh, the only difference is there's no uh, confirmation like there was with the other one. So I'm just gonna pop some values in this guy. Assign him. And we've got a success. It takes you right to the task. And if I go back to my guy here, we can see that we've got the values. That's all I had. I just wanted to show the new model that we've uh, changed. That's great, Chris. Thank you. And no questions so far. So let's see who's next. So up next is Partha. Hey. Hey, so you have some import export hammer improvements to show us, Partha? Yep. Uh, can you guys see my screen? I can now. Can you make that maybe slightly bigger? Yeah. Looks better. Thank you. Okay. Uh, also, just checking. You guys can see this clearly, right? Yeah, it's perfect. Thank you, Partha. Beautiful. Thank you. So, in the in the previous, this is this is a teaser for a deep dive that I plan to do or we plan to do later, uh, uh, shortly at some point. Uh, so in the past, we have, we have demoed like APIs related to import and export. But uh, last month, uh, we worked pretty hard on getting a ni nice set of hammer bindings that to, to make the story more coherent. Uh, so I'm just going to show you some of the commands we have. I'm going to just export, show you how to export the library repository, how to import the library repository, just like two or three sample commands. Uh, I may run over time by a minute or two. I apologize in advance. Uh, so let me let me show you where we started with. So if I did hammer, you will see that there's two new commands here. There's something called a content export and a content import. So these are new sub commands we've added. So. Sorry. And if you see under Hammer Content Export, there are a couple of commands. Uh, there's something called a complete, a subcommand called complete, and a subcommand called incremental. So I, there are two forms of export we have. We, you can either export a full version of a content view or the library, or you can export the incremental version of the con you can just export the incremental so what that means is incremental implies that you already have exported previously and you're just adding you just want to export the new content instead of the full thing so let, let me let me reset the side okay let's see yeah, I'm a bug with the plugin here never mind uh so anyway let me start with and the content export complete log. So here you can further see that uh, here the options are library and version. So you can do a hammer content export complete library if you want. If you want the library uh, repo exported fully, same with version. You can pass it the version ID and it'll export the version ID fully. Uh, so let to just do a quick demo. Let me let me show what's in my export organization. So in my export organization library, one second. Let me do products again. Okay. So you see, this is a product. We have we have one product, and inside the product, we have three repositories here. Right. Now I want to let's say I I had another satellite where I wanted to import this. Uh, I want to export everything that's here in the library, not nothing, not not the country in the library itself. So what I do is what I can what I can do is I can say I'm gonna content. So let's get the organization list here just to just to make this easier for us. 
Okay. Oh, okay. Let me try it again. Uh, there you go. So I have the export org here, right? So let me do. Let me export the library for this guy. So all I have to do is add my content export complete library and give it an organization. Go. Hopefully, I typed all of it right. But so this should generate uh, this just generate a library export. It's it's working on it right now. There you go. While this is going on, I can I want to uh, okay actually okay it's done okay so let me just demo that first then. I did an ls minus lh, right? And said, show me everything that's in the export directory. You will see that you have, I have 68 megabytes worth of data. Now, just to, just to demo the incremental, let me change this to, uh, if, I, if I did incremental library, for example, right? Uh, let me add a repository to the library to make it more, more, more realistic. So I create a new repository. I have repo four. I call it, it's a yum type. And I think uh, my upstream URL, I'll give something, uh, I'll give this guy, tell client releases. And let me sync him. Just sync this guy. So, so the point here is I've I've exported the the three repositories we saw before. The repo four is what is what I've not exported yet. Right. So, if I just did hammer complete. Yeah, if I did hammer incremental now, just I'll just need the complete to incremental. I should only get the fourth repo that I add that I exported. So if I did NLS minus LH again on the second one, let's do it. Okay. Okay. There you go. It's 448 kilobytes. Now, just to show that it's incremental, let me just do a full export also just to show you that it is actually the incremental export. So if I, if I did complete here instead of Instead of incremental, I would I would get I would get everything. Uh, I would get six, the sixty eight megabytes plus whatever the four four forty eight k maybe so maybe just slightly over. Uh, it's a small repo that I think so. Okay. So this demonstrates. So if I did a let me do it again. Ls minus lh. There you go. So, yeah, it's it's not very clear, but it's, it's 68 megabytes for four plus 400 kilobytes. So it's a bad repo to, to demo, I guess, for incremental. But anyway, uh, so now let me, we have added bindings to content import also, right? So here's my import organization. Oh, okay, actually, before I jump into the import, let me show you one quick thing. Uh, if I go to content views, what you will notice is that uh, there is a new new view called export library. This the the way the export works is it generates a content view, right? And it just publishes all the all, it just adds all the packages 
because I did three, I got three different versions here. But it, what happens is when I say, hey, export the library, it just creates a content view under the hoods, adds all the repositories at that point of time, and then just publishes it and uses and exports that. So it's, that's, the, that's the sequence. So, so you will see something called an export library uh, and you go to content views if you export it by uh, export the library itself, re repos itself. Uh, now, let me show let me show you the what is an import organization. So we saw that in the export we had four repositories, right? We had uh, a repo for also. Uh, let me go to products again. Sorry. Yeah, we we ha we we had four repositories in the export organization. Now in the import, I created three of them as dummy repositories. There's these do not have a URL. They do not point to anything. They it's not synced content. This is purely the only way we are going to update the these three repositories is via uh, via the import process. So so let me let me import uh, the first one. If you see number okay. Um, it can clear this yeah better yeah so there is a if I type hammer content import I get uh, I get two things I I can either import a library or a version dump either one so let me get the let me get the stuff I exported already so there's a list command we have now where I can give an organization. I've got the name of the organization, just one minute. It'll be export 7442. Okay. Yeah, I have a random, random ID there. So, okay. Export 7442. There you go. So, this guy should give us a list of, yeah, here are the paths. Uh, Sorry for the formatting. It's just uh, I've zoomed the screen to a big number, but here are the paths. So let's let's try exporting this guy, the first one. And just to confirm, I got the path right. Let me paste it. Okay, good. So I have the path right here. Now, let me do the hammer content import, right? And give it, and I'm importing into the library. I'm giving it a path, so I'm giving it the path I have for 10. Uh, all right, and yeah, let me. Oh, I forgot. I think I had to give it an org name. Oh yeah, I had to give it an org name. That makes sense. <laughs> the organization name is import two nine five five zero. There you go. So this takes a little bit of time. Uh, yeah, I was thinking of adding a jingle while this was going on, but <laughs> uh, but I can I can show you something about it while the import is happening. Uh, you can see. Uh, uh, content, yeah. So if I go to content views, right, I should see this new content view called import library, right? Now, if I clicked on this, I would see uh, one of the versions imported. Version 1.0 was imported. So as a user, now if you go to products, uh, The import was complete, so I'm, I go to product, and voila, I see, I see the three repositories here, all all populated with the contents of version one of. Now, I wanted to just do an increment, like it, just to show you the import for the increment also works. So let me create a new repository called repo four here because I had four repositories in my export. I'm creating a new repository with the same name in my import import organization. So let me save it again. 
it's just a dummy. There's no URL here. There's nothing I'm syncing. It's all coming from the import. So let me just do the incremental import. So, so hammer. I have to just change the path here and say, just use the second one. Uh, yeah, this guy. Okay. So, yeah. Again, let's see if, as it's running, you can see if it created a new version. So, if I went to content views again, let me open it in the new window. And then I click on import library. See, so it's, you see then it's creating a new version and it's importing the contents here, right? And then, yeah, if you give it a minute or 30, 20 seconds, it should complete. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so it says it imported eight packages here. If I go to products again and open my product, uh, there you go. I should see the fourth repo also imported. Uh, this is just a teaser. There's a lot more you can do with import export, but this is all what I had for the demo today. Uh, thanks. thanks, thanks, Bartha. And um, we're going to very soon be setting up a deep dive into this. Um, so I will be in touch with you after this to to set up a date. And um, I think we are slightly, actually not too bad by the looks of it, just slightly. Um, ahead of the live stream but not by much but i so far i don't see any questions so thank you very much partha and then our next demo is john with a content view filter page and tasks button thanks Bonnie. let me share my screen okay so i have some updates for the new uh Catello content view page. Um, the big one is the filters tab is created. Um, it's a it's just a table now. It's read only and we're going to add the the create filter uh, functionality later. Um, but it's your typical table. You can uh, paginate and search that. Um, and for now, it is linking to the old content view uh, filter details page. So I'm building that functionality out now, and it will link to the new page. But for now, we've linked it to the old page. So these pages can be, uh, these new pages can be functional and testable. Um, the other addition is this view task button. Uh, this is something, if I actually go to this old page, um, we have this task tab here, but the task page has been rewritten and it, it's really nice. Um, so we decided to just redirect our users to that page with the proper search query filled out for the content view. Um, and it does open up in a new tab. That's something that's a little new too as well. So here is the task page, and you can see it's a little squished together, but you can see the uh, the content view tasks uh, here. And that's it for me, the filters tab and the task uh, button that redirects to a new page. Short and sweet. Thank you, John. Um, let me see. I have a question. Oh, excellent, excellent. Um, which content types uh, are currently supported? Um, for the filters? Yeah. It'd be the same functionality as the old page. Oh. So, yeah, it would, it's the, the same as it was. OK, because, uh, well, some um, weeks ago or days ago, uh, we added a Debian package content filters. Um, it's currently a pull request, but it would be interesting if such functionality can also 
be used with a Debian package. Yeah, let me uh, let me take a look at that. And um, yeah, that's definitely something we'd want to make sure the new page supports. But yeah, we, we can look at that and, and continue the discussion. Cool. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your question. Um, I don't think that we have any other questions. So our next demo will be Samir with the content view create and copy models. And in your own time, Samir, I know we didn't get much time at the beginning. Great. Uh, thanks, Melanie. Let me try presenting. All right. Does this look OK? Um, I think it does. Maybe can you? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Uh, so I want to demo some uh, a couple of things on the new Catalogs uh, content view UI. So first one is the create content view flow. So we have added a button on the list page, create content view. And this opens up a new module. And you can fill it in and I'll leave these. And this is pretty much the same fields that you have in the old UI. You can go ahead and create. It redirects you to the uh, details page. This is in the new UI. And that's about it for the create flow. And the next thing is the copy. So this is the repo I created. So we have this action here, copy. This will open a new module to copy the CV. And this will create a copy for the content view. Uh, this is the same functionality. It's just on the new UI. And yeah, that's about it. Thank you, Sammy. Questions quiet today. Uh, okay, Doc, so we can move on to our next demo, which is Ian with uh, Container Gateway Unauthenticated Repo Caching. All right, thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, excellent. So, everyone, this is an update on the Smart Proxy Container Gateway for Catello. Just as a quick reminder, this is the new way for people to consume um, container content um, as a container registry if they're using Pulp3 um, on their Smart Proxies. Um, this is something that folks will get to start using um, as from, it should be as from um, Catello 4.0. But so, just as an update here, um, when I first presented the Smart Proxy Container Gateway, um, you could pull any repository, regardless of whether or not you should have access to it. You could pull for uh, any uh, container image. But now we've added a way um, so that only container images that are within lifecycle environments that have the unauthenticated pull set to yes can be pulled so that you can limit access to certain um, container repositories. So let me just show you how this works here. So on the container gateway, there is a simple unauthenticated repository list that is stored currently um, in a Postgres database, the same one, the same Postgres that um, Pulpcore is running on, in fact, which uh, does work kind of nicely because Pulpcore is required, of course. Um, so pretty much how this works, it's very simple. When you do a smart proxy sync, um, as long as there are, is new content um, to actually sync or if changes were made, um, Catello will just do a, um, an HTTP put request over to your smart proxy with all of the unauthenticated repos. So let's just, let me just show you what I have set up for my little demo. Um, so I have two environments here, one called env with unauthenticated pull set to on, and it has two images. 
um, the library slash hello world in Fedora SSH. And then I have another environment called a super secure environment where unauthenticated pull is off. It just has one new image, which is Prometheus slash BusyBox. And then my smart proxy is this CentOS 7 proxy develop2 box, which uh, is consuming from the lifestyle environments and, and super secure. And so I skipped the smart proxy sync for the sake of time, but just to show you that it happened, this, this is the console for the smart proxy. So you can see this put request that I've highlighted here in the console. And this was done by Catello. This is Catello sending the unauthenticated repositories to the container gateway. So you can see this container gateway v2 unauthenticated repository list URL. You can use that to see the unauthenticated repos, and you can use that um, with a put to <clears throat> overwrite the unauthenticated repository list. So with that out of the way, just a quick look at my CV. So I have two versions. Version one is what has been promoted to env. And you can see it has less content than version two. This just has the two uh, repositories. And then version two has library and super secure env. And this has more content. So it has that Prometheus BusyBox image. So let's just take a look at what we have here. So the first thing we can do is if we want to curl, curl that repo list, um, we have the repo list right here. So this is straight from curl. We have two repositories. Um, we have my Fedora SSH one, and then we have the Hello World one. Now, we don't expect people to curl the unauthenticated repo list to actually see what images are there. So you can also do a podman search. So this is what users will actually check out when they're doing it. So you can see the same thing popped up. We have Fedora SSH and then Hello World. So just for fun, um, we should be able to Docker pull or Podman pull one of these. Let's see. So I'm pulling the Fedora SSH. Should finish any time now. All right, there we go. So if I do uh, image ls, you can see that it got pulled. Let's see here. And yeah, that's pretty much it for the unauthenticated repo list. I'll also add that we recently added support. We started adding support for uh, Docker slash Podman login. So now we get the token over from Catello. And we store that. and. So that'll be for further use with, with actually using un, or actually authenticated repos as well. So you don't just have to consume repos from the unauthenticated list. And I'll just add that this should be useful for people even now as is, um, because you'll be able to limit that access and pull from your un, unauthenticated repos. But be looking in the future soon for more additions to this. Um, and yeah, thanks. That's, that's all I got. Great, Ian. Thank you very much. And okay, Doc, yeah, nothing from anywhere. So we can move on to James with uh, repository indexing optimization. Uh, thanks, Melanie. Um, yeah, uh, got a real short uh, demo. It's actually more of a uh, just showing you an optimization that we put in for indexing content. Uh, what we were observing was there were some unnecessary indexing operations going on whenever you were publishing a content view uh, version. Um, so I've got um, the results of two different uh, publications. Uh, in the first case, we've got a before this, a 3.18, and then another one in a system that we, I've patched uh, with our optimization. And you can see that we've got two versions. Uh, it's the same content, the same repository, We've just done two straight publications with no changes. On the first one, if we look at the, uh, the task details in the Dynflow console, uh, you're going to see that there's two indexing operations. So there's the first one. And then below, there was the other one. And 
uh, they both take up a certain amount of time. Now for this repository, it's trivial, but imagine if you had a repository with thousands and thousands of packages, this can be a pretty wasteful. The second in indexing uh, is oftentimes unnecessary because there've been no changes. Uh, the optimization that we put in basically checks to see that if the content matches between versions and it's not an archived copy, uh, we don't re-index the content. And so the outcome there is, uh, you know, we're going to index, this is an archive copy, so we're going to do the full indexing, which is a certain amount of time. But the second indexing on the same repository with the same matching content, we actually skip it. And if you look at the Dimeflow console, if you're looking to do, for debugging purposes, we'll actually put out a message that says post action skip. That just means that the indexing has been skipped. Really useful for um, repositories where they're just publishing them and there's been no substantial changes. Saving a little bit of time and uh, the user's time as well. That was it. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, you're still demoing. No, I don't see any questions so far. So we can move on and we can move on to Justin with uh, Pulp3 uh, Migration Progress Reporting, please. Hopefully all is going okay for you now, Justin. Oh, look, I see you, I hear you, it's all good. Perfect, all right. Uh, so the, the Pulp3 Migration has been around for a little bit in um, 3.17, 3.18, and up until 3.18.1, uh, I believe, um, when you ran the migration, you didn't get any feedback. It would just kind of sit there, and these migrations can take hours or days based on how much content you have. Uh, so the Pulp team had put in a, a good bit of effort to add in progress reporting to the to their API so that we could check um, and provide some status to the user. And we've now exposed this to the user. So when you run the migration, um, and this will this will get started here in a second. It'll go through different phases, and so you don't necessarily get an overall view of where you are in the in the migration, but you do see progress happening. So if there's ever a concern that something's uh, not, or if there's a concern that things are stuck um, or not moving along, uh, you can monitor the output and, and see. Uh, that there is. So this actually completed very quickly, um, but you can see this. There was a count here of uh, three content. So I thought it would happen slower than that. Uh, but you'll see as the migra as the RPMs are getting migrated, as the repositories are getting migrated, you'll see a kind of a total count and then a um, partial count. Um, and so you can kind of monitor the current step in the process. And that was it. Thank you, Justin. Um, and that, so I will just, you're still presenting, so I'll just leave it a second. I'll just say that um, it was requested that we trial a format change for the community demos um, for this year. So that would be the conclusion of the form and demos that are user focused. And up next, we have three demos that are form and developer focused for the most part. So this, so the first of these demos is from Yifat, uh, who is demoing a fix um, about host uh, substances. She can probably explain it better than me. So. I, yes. In, thank you, Yifat, in your own time, please. Yes, hi, I will share my screen one second. Okay, do you see my format? I do. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so what I wanted to show you today is actually related to what Dominic showed before, uh, which is that every host status can be clickable and linked to whatever page you want it to link. Uh, for example, we can see here the execution status that has the last execution succeeded linked to uh, uh, 
uh, the last execution uh, succeeded. Uh, so we can see it here. So uh, we actually have, uh, this is well to the uh, compliance status, but we don't have here a compliance status to show. Uh, it links to the host compliance uh, report. Uh, and so what I wanted to, um, to show you today is uh, this uh, option and also let you know that uh, it is very simple if you want to make your uh, uh, status host status clickable as well. All you need to do is to implement uh, the method called status link in your status file, for example, the compliance status or execution status and uh, make it return the link to the page you wish clicking uh, the status will bring you. Um, so you can see here an example. Uh, I have the compliance status uh, file and uh, an implementation, a very simple one, to uh, the method status link. Uh, so every host uh, substatus can be uh, transformed to a clickable one. Uh, and that's it for me, actually. Thanks. Thank you, that was perfect. Um, so I don't see any questions because we're having a bit of a quiet day, um, it seems. Um, but up next is John with a new React component, uh, inline edit. Yep, thanks, Melanie. Uh, let me share my screen again. Uh, so just want to share this component I made. Um, we originally used it in the content view details uh, page, and I moved it to Foreman. Um, it's just an inline edit. You can edit and make a backend call uh, all in line. Uh, you can exit out of that. Um, and then there's also a option for a text area. Uh, and if nothing's provided, it'll just say none provided. Um, so we use that here. So I can edit the description. This is a text box. I can submit it. Um, and then I have it set up to, set to uh, fire off a toast notification on success or error. Uh, the page did reload. That's not part of the component. We're going to update that to uh, uh, a more smoother transition, but that's it. Perfect, thank you, John. And then our final demo of the day is Justin with stab stable uh, dev boxes for us. Yes, um, so the problem that sort of we we had was if if we ever need to do a fix for an older version of Catello, um, especially when you start getting like more than a release behind, using master is really difficult. You might have a different version of pulp, you might have a different version of candle pen, um, you might have a different set of, of gems installed. Um, and so we didn't have an easy way of, of kind of going back in time and having a developer box um, that you could use to work on a fix. This is especially the case if you need to re-record like VCR cassettes against Pulp or Candlepin. And with Pulp 3, I think this kind of became more of, a, of an issue because we're soon going to be dropping Pulp 2. And so if we need to go back and work on a, a fix with Pulp 2, uh, it would kind of be impossible to do once installer changes are made to completely remove it. So I was just checking um, about your presentation. Okay. Sorry yeah. for interrupting you. That's OK. That's OK. I, I was kind of talking before I, I moved to my browser. Um, and so John, in the past, had worked on this document, which was how to create and set up stable dev boxes. And this was really just used for nightly uh, dev boxes so that we could have a, a dependable dev box that we didn't have to, uh, or that would still be available even if the nightlies were broken, the nightly developer box. So I piggybacked on this and created some scripting so that we can easily uh, build like a 318 or a three, uh, going in the future would be a 319, or sorry, 4.0 uh, stable dev box. And, uploading them to Vagrant Cloud. 
And so I'm more highlighting this uh, so that uh, developers know that this is available. If you need to go back and fix a bug on 3.18, whether it be two weeks or six months from now, um, it is available. And that's probably the easiest way to fix a bug on 3.18. And this is now part of the release process for Catello. So we will have, uh, we should have them going forward. And there are instructions on uh, using the version specific box here. So if you're if you're just wanting to consume one of these, you can just uh, look at this section here. And this readme is in the forklift repo under the Packer directory. And that's it. Thank you, Justin. Um, yep, I don't think I don't think we have any questions. Um, so I think that might be it for today. If you had any questions that were um, that you didn't get a chance to ask, um, you can write to us on the Foreman Community Discourse on IRC, or you can drop a comment here afterwards, and I'll ensure that you get an answer. I'd like to thank everybody who presented today, everybody who watched us on the live stream, and we will be back very soon with another demo. Thank you very much.